All right, welcome to episode 60 of the At Bat Podcast presented by War Media, where we give you our thoughts on the latest Chicago baseball news, as well as take a trip around the league. I am Saul Rodriguez, joined by Gabe Wilkins, who, of course, you've seen on War Media's Open Run. This is officially our trade deadline show. Uh, we're sitting here on Tuesday, August 1st, uh, 730. So the deadline has come and gone. Um, it was actually a way more intense day than I thought it would be. But Gabe, how are you doing? And how did you take in this uh, this deadline day today? I'm doing well. It was a few surprises. Yeah. But in a seller's market, when you have some bats that are available that teams are coveting and prioritizing in the hopes to, you know, elevate a top of their division races, if not gain a third or second spot in that wild card race, can't say that you're too shocked by everything mm -hmm. that you see. But outside of that, you know, not too much blockbuster headlines as far as trade deadline goes, but it was definitely a lot of noise that was made towards the final hours for sure, especially when it pertains to a specific team in this town that we are currently in here in Chicago. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, I mean, we the, both of these teams made some splashes regardless of, you know, which way direction they're going in. They still had – we have a lot to talk about with those teams. Uh, for sure, we'll delve into – of course, the the Chicago side of things first, but we also uh, will get to, you know, Max Scherzer going to the Rangers, you know, uh, Verlander, the Astros, those types of deals for sure. Um, but like I said, we'll start off with Chicago and, and we'll start off with uh, with the White Sox because those are the ones I think there were so many deals that you, you could talk about there from Jake Berger going to Miami to uh, Lance Lynn and uh, Joe Kelly going to L.A., but we'll start off with uh, with you, Gabe, and say and, and to ask you what deal uh, did you like the most? Which one stood out to you the most, um, or at least in in your sense, will make a difference? I think sooner rather than later. The deal that stood out to me the most was the deal that transpired just hours before the deadline, and that was the Miami Marlins White Sox trade involving Jake Berger for Jake Eater. Jake Berger was a guy that I heard a lot of speculations about as to whether or not he could be traded. But I kind of dismissed it personally. I didn't see how that could happen, especially when he had so many years of team control. Mm -hmm. But while I know a lot of fans are upset and let it be known that Jake Berger was a guy that I greatly appreciated and was a very positive highlight in a Sox season that has been filled with a myriad of lowlights, to say the least on it, and to put it in a kind manner. He he was a guy that has some issues with plate discipline. And while he was coming in the form, to be able to get an arm like Jake Eater, that's kind of curious to me or whatever. Like I'm curious to see how he's going to progress because he seems like a guy that, even though he's in double A, he's 25 years old, but he's a prospect that is said to have an electric fastball as well as some all-speed stuff who, if he gets it together, could possibly be a top-of-the-line rotation starter as early as next year. Would that, would, would that happen? It remains to be seen, but that trade just took me by surprise. Now, the Lance Lynn-Joe Kelly deal in, with the Dodgers involving the Dodgers' number ninth-ranked prospect, Nick Nasrini, I'm very curious to see how he progresses now that he's coming from a, a talented organization such as the Dodgers, which is huge on player development over to the South side and going to trip a double a Birmingham, excuse me, to work out some kinks in his command and whatnot, which if he's able to get together could possibly be a guy that is a top of the line rotation starter next year, if not 2025, I think the white Sox this time around seem to be trying to do their homework on a lot of prospects and Unlike the first time where they were going after a lot of top line prospects, they're going after prospects that are close to being on the verge of making it mm -hmm. to the show. And how they perform over the course of the next several months and the minors remains to be seen, but that's going to be key because it's going to tell us a lot about which direction this team could possibly go in in 2024 and beyond. It's just a lot of questions. Marks, but those are the two deals that really stood out to me besides the deal that we talked about last week involving Giolito and Lopez for Edgar Caro and Kyle Bush and that Sox Angels deal. 
Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned it. I mean, uh, a lot of these guys, uh, you know, for example, for example, uh, you know, Nick uh, Nastrini, he's also his ETA is 2024. It's funny because you look at the White Sox top prospects now, the top 10 and like four of the guys weren't even there well, a week ago. I don't know. So, right? <laughs> so, so, that, so that's, that's pretty cool to see. And the fact that, yeah, you are right there doing their homework and anytime you do make a deal and we've talked about this before, but the fact that, you know, anytime you do a deal with the Dodgers is a good thing because their prospects are, you know, they have prospects, you know, you know, so many, you know, and, and, you know, it's unfortunate they couldn't find a deal with the Orioles. We've been talking about that because the Orioles really wanted something and they really want to do something, but it looked like, and we'll get to the Orioles in a minute. Cause I did want to talk about them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that you get, uh, you do a deal with a team that has uh plan- like a, you know, s- you know, stars in their system, it works out. And, you look at yeah, Jake Eater. I mean, dude, he's six four, two fifteen. I mean, he he's got like a like a. It almost looks like you look at him because I saw a video of him. You know, it almost remind it almost kind of reminds me of like of like a Paxton, James Paxton. It's like a tall, lanky, that. yeah, who, who throws some heat, you know, and and he he, he brings it. So that's it's cool to see, and I could definitely see. I mean, and and the White Sox have had some success in in the last you know decade with you know lanky left handers. So that might you know that might work out. That would be really cool. Um. On the other side of town, the Cubs, you know, obviously they're trying to make a run here. Uh, you know, they they they're playing a big series against the Reds right now in game two. They lost the first one six to five on Tuesday here as we're recording this in the second inning up five two. But you know, they're they're not playing around either because they were out here uh and they made a deal for uh Jamer Candelario. And and man, I mean that that surprised I think a lot of people because he's probably he probably was, if not the first the you know, top uh if not the top one of the top three bats available at the deadline and they were able to get them. And, you know, regardless of, you know, if they didn't do enough, because realistically, I don't think they did enough uh, bullpen wise, but they got Jose Quas from the Royals as well in a deal. And then they also made a deal uh, at, like uh, a few hours before the deadline, sending uh, Adrian Sampson, Manuel Rodriguez, uh, and an international bonus uh, pool space to the race for right-hander Josh Robertson who I think is going to go straight to the minors. I don't necessarily think uh, he's going to come up to the majors this time soon, but we'll see what happens there. But uh, that's one of those deals where, um, you know, Adrian Sampson didn't get a lot of play here. You know, he got maybe one season and he was, you know, he had a solid season then, but Manuel Rodriguez, I mean, that dude throws heat, but he just could never locate. And uh, so I'm interested to see what the Rays do there, but I wanted to get your opinion because I know for me off the top, man, I mean, Getting the Candelario deal is obviously the, the the main thing of the deadline. That's pretty you know awesome. The Cubs have needed a third baseman. The Cubs have needed somebody at the corner. He's going to play both. As today he's playing first base, um, so he he's very he's versatile there. Uh, so I think that's probably the thing that that I was really excited about to see. Obviously, he's been with the Cubs before. Came up in 2016, played a few games there, um, and you know that was cool as well. But yeah, what what are your thoughts as as you know the, as the Cubs? You know that not only have did they make a, you know, did they make a statement saying they're buyers, but man, they proved it. Well, I mean, it, it was only right, especially mm-hmm. when you look at the way that they have been playing. Like I believe they're nine and two in their last 11 games mm-hmm. as of this recording. And anytime you can get a guy like Jaime, Jaime Candelario, who has good defense at third base has provided a solid back thus far throughout the season, at least during his time in Washington. You'll take that, especially when you have Patrick Wisdom, who's been struggling and batting under 200 this year, in spite of showing some solid signs of life early on in the year. He's cooled off lately. And then you have Nick Madrigal, who's really a second baseman, playing out of position in short stints at third, albeit has held his own for the most part. You got a real third baseman in the building now. And you add that on top of the fact that he could play first base and provide a solid bat for you in the lineup, you would take that, especially when the Cubs offense has been up and down throughout giving stretches of this season. So he's a veteran. He has an LPS over 800. He's hit over 15 plus home runs. He's going to provide some power. That, that, that's something that you need, especially in the NL central race. Like we always talk about it's still there for the taking and You have big games coming up with the likes of Cincinnati and Atlanta as well this upcoming weekend. Yeah. And, 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 you know, speaking of, of guys like wisdom, you know, some people thought, Hey, you know, bringing in Candelario, does that mean wisdom's gone? Does that mean they make a move, whatever? And it actually turned out to be Mancini. Mancini got DFA today. Um, And, you know, I'm, you know, to be honest, he didn't provide much of anything throughout the season. 
I have said this before. I said it's okay if they keep him because you know he's a good guy to have in the clubhouse. But if they find a deal for him, sure. In this case, I'm sure they tried to deal him, but they probably couldn't find anyone, so they just DFA'd him. Uh, so I like I like those moves because it shows the Cubs are serious. You know, it shows that they wanna they wanna you know get a roster you know where that's successful, that's consistent throughout. And you know, with Candelario coming in too, some people have been talking about the fact that probably gonna see less of Seiya Suzuki on a and on an everyday basis. Um, as he's been really struggling. Um, and uh, I think right now his strongest suit has really just been um, the, 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 you know, playing the field and uh, playing against lefties. But even then he hasn't had a lot of success because, you know, the last, you know, few weeks when he, whenever they're playing a, a left-handed pitcher, he's hit second. And a lot of people have been like, you know, why is he hitting second? He's got like a seven ten OPS, but he actually does kill uh, lefties. Uh, not, I don't know if that's a good enough excuse for anyone else, but that's what he does. And, um, but yeah, it's unfortunate because that's it's a guy that hasn't lived up to the deal, you know, and you know, it's a guy who they who they paid a hundred million or the contract's worth a hundred million dollars. Um, it's a guy that I'm sure the Cubs are gonna, you know, try to have, you know, hopefully helps them get Otani because it's one of his buddies as he's played with over there in Japan. Um, but yeah, just on the field, he hasn't had a lot of success, and you know, this deal uh will obviously help the Cubs kind of you know, fill in the blanks when it comes to their lineup and uh, to kind of be more assured against, yeah, you're right, against this competition in the Central, who who they all, you know, it, the Reds the Reds didn't add a bat, if I, if I remember correctly. The Brewers did add uh, with um, Carlos Santana, and uh, they, they added somebody else, I'm right, Blanken. Mark they Can- Marcana. Yeah, yeah, well, Marcana, yeah, from the Mets. So mm-hmm. they did, they definitely, you know, they, they knew they needed to add something. Uh, you know, the Brewers were actually in the hunt for Eloy Jimenez, um, but they ended up, they, I guess they, they probably didn't like what, what the, what the Sox wanted out of, or, you know, from them, but that would have been, I mean, I, I personally, I'm telling you, Gabe, when I saw those rumors, I was scared. <laughs> cause, cause well, you know, I understand, <laughs> I, I understand, but Milwaukee, they, they definitely didn't stand pat. They made some big moves. Yeah. They actually added to their bullpen as well. Mm-hmm. Getting Chafin. Andrew Chafin yeah, you know, yeah. from Arizona. That, that, that's a huge presence. Anytime yep. you can have him on that back end through the seventh, through the ninth inning with a guy like Devin Williams. To close out games for that mm-hmm. bunch, I, I I like what they're doing, and then they got that young arm and Abner Uribe, who's been coming on lately. He gave Bryce Harper some fits last month during a, a, a pivotal set of games they had in Philadelphia at the top mm-hmm. part of July. I, I like what Milwaukee's doing, but mm-hmm. the asking price was always going to be very high. I felt like yeah. for the White Sox when it came to Eloy, and as we know, that asking price when it's a seller's market, if you're not meeting it as a buyer. You're going to have a tough time. And I think a lot of fans need to process that and pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. There are so many teams in need of arms and bats, but it all has a price at the end of the day. And that's the thing that I wish some of these fans would think about that love the drama of the trade deadline, but don't understand that for every deal that you see getting cut, it's so many that you see that don't get cut, such as what we saw involving L.A. and Detroit mm-hmm. when it came to Eduardo Rodriguez. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, looking at the the teams like the Reds, teams like the Orioles, um, you know, the the Reds ended up getting a left-hander uh, for the bullpen, Sam Mole. You know, he, mm-hmm. you know, nothing major there, 454 ERA. But, you know, they, they definitely added something, which is nice for them. Um, not, ex- not, not as much as I expected them. Same with, like, the Orioles. But, like I said, we'll, we'll get to that. But overall, I think in Chicago, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you know, with the asking price for, for Eloy is, you know, I wanted to mention something else before we move on with cease. It's like, you know, people hear, Oh, they're, they're hearing things in, in the sense of like the socks are list they're listening. doesn't mean they're going to train him. And it was one of those things where like, they probably just, they had him out there and they were trying to like, you know, you know, get the right deal, but nobody was actually down for that. And I'm sure like, you know, the Orioles were listening or Orioles, listened and stuff like that and try to put, you know, put, you know, a package deal, but nothing ever, you know, happened out of that. Um, but I'm sure, I mean, how do, how do you feel personally? I know you wanted to keep him. I think you've made it up. You made it a point earlier. You said to keep, you wanted to keep him if it was the right deal, whatever, whatever. But how do you feel about going into 2024 now? And you have guys like Cease, Robert and company, you know, that, you know, in, in a year where uh, Bob, I think it was Bob Nightingale said that the Sox are trying to compete in 2024. Yeah, I, I heard that, but I'm I'm yeah. at the point with the White Sox where as a fan, you got to show me. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as how they handle things with Dylan Cease, I give Rick Hahn his just due. I think he did his mm-hmm. due diligence, and rightfully so. 
I think that if there was ever a time to trade Dylan Cease, I don't think that this was like the the time that you just had to do it. This is a situation that you could revisit six months from now mm-hmm. at the winter meetings with the same teams that were said to be linked to Dylan Cease, who will more than likely still be linked to Dylan Cease, depending on where they are going into the postseason or where they finish the postseason this year at. The way I see it is this. Rick Hahn was never going to sell low on Dylan Cease, and he shouldn't have. A guy like Dylan Cease, who's under control for the next two years, should warrant you at least three top 100 prospects. We know that the Baltimore Orioles have a glutton of them. I think, in my own personal opinion, that Rick Hahn was big game hunting. I think that he was searching for a deal that me and you have talked about off the record many times where it involved a guy like a Jackson Holiday or Colton Cowles. And we know that the Baltimore Orioles have made it well aware that they're not going to trade Jackson Holiday. They've also made it well aware with the moves that they made that they're going to seek to play this conservatively. And they're not going to try and trade away top prospects to try and bolster they're starting pitching. However, like Michael Jordan said in the last dance, winning has a price. And when it is a seller's market and you are the Baltimore Orioles, you're first place in American League East, and you declare yourself a buyer, sellers expect you to act like a buyer. And when you have so many young guys that's in your rotation, such as Grayson Rodriguez, Cal Bradish, Tyler Wells, who you just recently demoted to the minors, but you know, you, you have all these young pieces like you, you're going to have to give up some, and everybody can't play in the Orioles organization mm-hmm. with the big league club. There are so many guys that I can name Connor Norby, Samuel Basayo. Like I, I get it. I get it. So I, I the only reason why I said you couldn't trade Dylan C's, is because if you do, you're walking into 2024 without a starting ace in your rotation. Now you have the possibility of having that. And you can still trade Dylan C's, but if you do, you better make damn sure that you're going on a market to acquire a top-of-the-line starting pitcher that's going to consist of a rotation with young pitchers beside him. Yeah, I, I agree. So especially, you know, when when you're talking to teams like the Orioles, it's like, yeah, you you want to get as much as you can, and they have so much to give. Um, I do want to ask you this though: when it comes to cease, is like the I guess the only other thing too that might, I guess, necessarily be scary. You might and you might disagree in the sense like anything can happen. We know baseball uh, as much as anybody here. Anything can go. Anything ha- could happen when it comes to pitchers. But I feel like, do you see a scenario where like? What if Cease goes the wrong direction and then they he loses value? Like, do you see that happening? Like, what if like what if he devalues himself? That's why a lot of people or some people I saw some people have the conversation of they should trade him now because like, you know, what if next year he comes back as another four ERA, whatever. But do you think like it does that does that if you were a GM, does that kind of like make you want to deal him now? Or is that something that you're not worried about because one, his stuff, two, you've seen him at his best, whatever. What do you think about that? You can't have that mindset as a GM and try and mm-hmm. predict the future. And if you're a guy like Rick Hahn who bought him into the organization via trade with the Chicago Cubs, if you're going to retain a guy like Dylan Cease, you have to have some level of faith and belief in him that he's going to find a way to turn it around. I think Dylan Cease has the ability to be an ace for any rotation that he's a part of as long as he finds a way to do things such as cutting down on walks mm-hmm. and not putting himself in jams that lead to him giving up several runs in an inning and cost him a quality start or performance on the mound. Mm -hmm. You can't have that attitude. And the one thing about Dylan Cease that makes me believe that he has a higher upside than what some fans might believe is that he's not like a power pitcher. Dylan Cease isn't just some guy that blows you away with Mm -hmm. his heat. He knows how to mix it up a little bit. His slider is solid. His fastball can work. He has a knuckle curve pitch that's been solid for him off and on as long as he's located in the right places. That's the things that help him. And if he can develop that change up some more, 
it could really unlock some things in his toolbox that helps him elevate up where you see the signs that you saw last year from him, which culminated in him finishing as a runner up in the American League Cy Young Award race to Justin Verlander. So I, I, I wouldn't worry about that. What I would worry about is how is he developing and is he ready to step in to a role of being a number one starter? And that's what I would look for down the stretch of the season if I was Rick Hahn and company in the front office now that he is indeed the number one starter in this White Sox rotation with Lucas Giolito gone and Lance Lynn gone, among others. Yeah, no, I agree. His stuff for sure is going to age well. I think it's one of those things where he's going to, once he, you know, I think at some point the velocity goes down, right? But his slider and his other breaking pitches are just so good that that's not even going to matter. Um, and I think even he could survive with like, you know, 93, 94, whatever it goes down to. Um, yeah. So, and that's, and that's another thing too, is that if the Sox are serious about like whether it is contending, as you say, you got to see it to believe it. If they are contending, trying to contend, you know, you to have a guy like Cease and to have a guy like Robert is a good starting point. Um, or, you know, if they're going to make some moves in the off season, whatever it is, um, that's a good, it's a good, it's a good, you know, foundation. So, and as, as, as hard as pitching is to come by, as we've talked about before on this show, especially as weak as a free agency, uh, you know, uh, in the off season, it's going to be, you know, it's important to have a guy like him. So um, it's, you know, good to see they retained him uh, moving on to the rest of the league. There's a lot of teams, a lot of deals that happened, but I think, um, you know, in particular teams like the Rangers, you know, I think, you know, you can make an argument won the deadline because they made some huge deals um, to replenish some injuries uh, to uh, just kind of make a statement that they're here. To, they're here to compete for a world series, man. And, you know, the Rangers got, went out there and got, um, you know, Max Scherzer and they went out, they got the Jordan Montgomery. Mm -hmm. um, they got uh, even Austin hedges, you know, pe people might say it's an irrelevant deal, but I think it's very important because you have a guy who frames well, he's not there. He's not, he's not going to go there to hit because obviously uh, he's got a, a, a sub 700 OPS, but he's going to frame very well. And they needed that because Jonah Heim obviously is, is, you know, is down and he was one of the better framers as well. So, um, but in your opinion overall, and we'll get into each team as well, but uh, in your opinion, who do you think won the deadline as of right now? Hmm. I mean, as of, as of right now, one team that I can say that definitely won is the team that you talked about mm -hmm. was the Texas Rangers. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have Jacob DeGrom down and you find a way to, spend as much money as they did in the off season, in the last two off seasons rather, and you find a way to get uh, Max Scherzer in the building with Jordan Montgomery, two guys that have playoff experience and pitching in big games, you will take that. And then what that shows me is, is that their front office is committed to building a winner under Bruce Bochy, a manager who's been there and done that, as we know, led the Giants to three World Series championships in the last decade. I, I'm, I'm interested to see how they make that work, especially with Nathan Ovaldi, who mm -hmm. I believe is going on the IL. Yeah. But when he returns, they have a solid three-man rotation that if they're clicking on all cylinders come October, could be a dangerous out, especially with that offense, which we know can put up runs with the best of them if not anybody in the league. So I, I, I like what Texas did, but the team that I'm disappointed with is the team that we just talked about, the Baltimore Orioles. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in the American League East. Even though Tampa Bay had a rough month, you, you're in first place. The Yankees are in last place. And this division, as we know, all the teams are over 500. It, it could be anybody's division depending on how the next two to three weeks go? You got to put your foot on these guys' neck if you're Baltimore, mm -hmm. and you got to you got to put the to push the chips where they lay. I don't think they did that. Mm -hmm. And even though I love this group, I love this ball club, and these young guys fight. They have not gotten swept in a series all year. As a matter of fact, they haven't got swept in a series since Adley Rushman came up a seat a year ago. That's great. Last summer, which is remarkable. But Cal Bradish, Jack Flaherty. Dean Kramer, Kyle Gibson, Grayson Rodriguez. That's your five-man rotation. I don't know how much you can trust those guys with the money on the line. Jack Flaherty has Cy Young stuff when he's on, 
but we know when he's not on, it could be very problematic. And while I like the back end of their bullpen, they could have used some help from the top down as far as pitching. And in order for you to get that top of the line pitching, it requires you to pay a price, especially when you have as many top 100 prospects as they have. At some point, they're going to have to get rid of some of that talent down on the farm if they really want to be a legitimate player. But I hope it's not too late for their sake. Yeah, man. Yeah, you said. Yeah, you said it. You you hit hit the nail on the head there. The Orioles they they slept on this deadline, man. I think. Look, I think at the end of the day, when I look at this Orioles team, I, I, it's one of those things where nothing's guaranteed, especially in this day and age with the AL East being as strong as it is. Like you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if next year these guys are going to hit the way they did, pitch the way they did, whatever. If you if there was any time to really go for it, and I understand, I understand you don't want to give up a, a Jackson Holiday. It's hard. I'm not going to say it's easy, but. It, you know, they have so many, as you, as you mentioned, some of the names in there, they have a plethora of guys they could give up, you know, give away for bit for major pitchers, like a guy like Scherzer or Verlander. I'm surprised they really didn't have a, you know, that they really didn't have a presence in that, those conversations at all. Like I kept seeing, uh, you know, the Astros in there, the Rangers in that conversation for Verlander as well. Just, I'm surprised I didn't see the Orioles in there either. Even for a guy like Eduardo Rodriguez, I was, I, you didn't really hear much of a connection with him and in, in the Orioles. So that, that was really disappointing because really they're playing this well without an ace and imagine just inserting a guy like, uh, like a healthy Verlander, healthy Scherzer, like, I mean, it could change the whole thing. And yeah. And you mentioned him, Jack Flaherty, like, you know, I've seen, I've seen him at his best, you know, with the Cardinals, but I've also seen him at his worst and he's still, you know, he's still on the younger side. He's still on the other, you know, so, you know, anything could happen there, but, it, it's asking a lot of him to come into the AL East and where he's already been struggling in, in the, in the, in the central and, and whatever. So it's asking a lot of him to come over to the AL East and, and have success in a pennant race, uh, let alone October. So uh, that's, it's going to be a rough road there, but it, at least they did something. I, I would have been, it would have been even more disappointing if they didn't get anybody. So I'm glad they got somebody. Um, but um, and another side of things, you know, looking at another AL East team, how do you feel about the 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 Blue Jays, for example? They went out there and got Paul DeYoung. Bo Bichette's injured, but he it actually doesn't happen to be uh, as serious as they thought it was at first. So, uh, like, what do you think about that move for Paul DeYoung? Do you think or did you expect the 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 Blue Jays to do more than they did? Um, only thing I expected the Blue Jays to do was acquired Teoscar Hernandez via trade mm -hmm. after it was reported that the Mariners were putting him on the block and they were so willing to put him on the block to the point where they took him out the lineup for this evening's contest against the Boston Red Sox. I really mm -hmm. thought he was going back to Toronto and I'm pretty sure it's been an emotional roller coaster for him over the last several hours to think that he was going to a place, but he ended up not. Paul DeYoung, I, I, don't, I don't mind that as an insurance option. You know, that, that gives them a quality guy that they can call on if, if need be, depending on whether or not Bo Bichette might require an IL stint, mm -hmm. which according to Bob Nightingale, no one knows as of yet the last time I checked up on the latest mm -hmm. news in regards to Bichette. But, I mean, in the American League East right now, when you, when you, look, at, when you look at where these teams are, man, you just got to go out and play. You know, it, it, you just got to go out and play and make the best team win, but I, I I mean I'm I'm not really too disappointed in them per se. I think getting Jordan Hicks was a big yeah. pickup though, especially in the wake of the injury to Jordan Romano, who's going to be out for a while with a back injury. Jordan Hicks will give them a top of the line closer on the back end of things, and add to a Blue Jays bullpen, which to my surprise, considered how they fared the last few years, has been one of the best bullpens in the American League. Yeah, you're right. And I think, you know, see, you know, seeing Jordan, you know, Hicks, you know, firsthand, I mean, that, that's a big arm right there to add into your bullpen, especially whenever Romana comes back, you know, if he's able to come back in time for October and all that, like that's going to be a, a pair of arms that are going to be pretty lethal and, you know, in big playoff series. Uh, you know, one team that I thought made some moves that were actually kind of interesting. And you, we mentioned them, we mentioned them already because they are, it's related to a, a Chicago team in the White Sox because they got Berger, but the Marlins, 
you know, they made they made that deal for Berger. They made that deal for Josh Bell, even though he's not he's not obviously hitting that well. But it's still it's still an interesting deal because it's a guy who still obviously can hit the long ball. He got eleven home runs this year. But what do you think about those moves that they made? And do you think that how much do you think it's going to help them in this race in the NL? Because they're you know obviously not going to win. They're not going to win the East as they, anything. It's, it's the Braves' it's the division, obviously there. But in the wild card race, who of course. That that NL wild card race. I mean, any 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 wild card race is wild, but the NL one in particular. You know, you had the Cubs at three and a half. Uh, the Marlins are half game out. You know, they're you know they got the Brewers and the Diamondbacks who are tied for that third spot. Third spot there. How much do those moves do you think help the Marlins in this wild card race? The Jake Berger move is very very interesting to me, only because. And I I don't want to take anything away from Jake Berger, but if you look at the majority of Jake Berger's numbers when, as far as home runs go, he's hit 25 on the year. I believe he's hit 17 out of his 25 at home. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed rate field is a very hitter-friendly ballpark in the summertime. He's going from guaranteed rate field to Lone Depot Park, which really is not the most hitter-friendly or ballparks. Oh. And I think that's something that a lot of White Sox fans need to keep in mind when they evaluate that trade, especially the ones that yeah. are emotionally invested into Jake Berger's story, which is a resilient story and a story that people should love and, and value if you really care about sports and players. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how he's going to work in Miami because that's a different beast trying to hit in that ballpark. Now, the Josh Bell signing, I feel like they're taking a gamble. Mm-hmm. Cleveland tried to sign him in the off season, and, and and they were successful in doing that. However, he hasn't fared well thus far this year. Could Miami be the spark plug to helping him turn around? Was been a rough twenty twenty three. I don't know, but they're definitely trying to go for it. But I don't know if, if it's enough. I just don't, and I I don't believe that it is. You know, you're 12 games out of the East. You're a half game back of the third wild card spot, as you mentioned. Man, like, these other teams are coming. Mm -hmm. They are coming. And in the National League East, where your schedule is rough day in and day out, man, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. Like, they're playing Philadelphia right now. So... I got to, I got to see it. I just, I just really got to see it from, from my end, but they're being aggressive. Yeah. More aggressive than what I've typically become accustomed to them being when they've been in these positions. Yeah. And, and uh, you're right. And I think with Jake Berger, it's one of those things where regardless, you know, I'm not saying he's not going to, he's not going to do this again, or he's not going to have a season like this again, but he's one of those guys where you feel comfortable selling high on as well. I think. Um, it's kind of like, kind of like how, when, you know, when Patrick wisdom went off, I was like, mm-hmm. you know what? I knew the Cubs had control for him a couple of years, but I was like, man, if you want to, if the Cubs want to sell high for the, for the, you know, with this guy, I wouldn't even mind at all, you know, and, um, ended up keeping him. But yeah, I think that's what I, what I thought about the Jake Berger deal, which I like personally, especially the fact that, the, you know, how much, uh, you know, the return looks, looks good. But another NL East team I wanted to ask you about too, which of course is always making headlines, right. Is of course the Mets. Uh, because they're just uh, all over the place and you don't even know what to think about them anymore. But of course they got rid of uh, Scherzer and Verlander, right. And, uh, in Canna and, and, and might be missing a couple other guys, but uh, Robertson as well. Uh, but th- they came out today that Scher- Scherzer, uh, basically let the cat out of the bag. Uh, and he told, I guess, really told all about Billy Epler and talked about how, he talked to Billy Eppler's and, and, and Epler said that, you know, the Mets aren't trying to compete until 25, 26, something like that. Um, anyways, what, what, what are your thoughts about the Mets right now? And a lot of the deals that they made actually too, they were, they gave a crap ton of money to the other teams. So it is one of those things where, man, you just, it just showed that uh, it just showed that, you know, Cohen was just so done with these guys and just wants to just go for it in the sense of like just getting rid of these guys aggressively. And he did so, but what do you think about the Mets situation? And, you know, do you see them, uh, you know, competing sooner or is that a window that you seem is pretty accurate or also 
is it surprising? Does it surprise you? Because I feel for me, it kind of does surprise me that they're like kind of throwing away next year and they're like, we're trying to compete like in 25 and 26 for a team with as much money as them. But I understand that some people are also like happy to see this because they're like, oh, you know, you can't buy championships. It's just proof that you can't buy championships. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's going to stop Cohen from going for when it comes to like big free agents, but that's just me. Yeah. But uh, what are your thoughts overall on that, man? You took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. It's not going to stop. Yeah. The show. And I'm not buying that they're trying to compete by 2025, 2026. Steve Cohen is a new owner. What do new owners love to do in sports? Spend money. Mm -hmm. He spent the money to get them. He's spending the money to help get rid of them. While at the same time, boosting his farm system with some talent, might I add. In the Max Scherzer deal, he got Luis Angel Acuna. Luis Angel Acuna, the younger brother of Ronald Acuna Jr., was a top five prospect in the Rangers organization. He is a top five prospect now in the Mets organization. That's a guy who could easily be Frankie Lindor's double playmate in the middle infield at second base. They also acquired prospects that were top of the line prospects, might I add, in the Astros farm system, which while not the best, they found a way to strike gold in the wake of getting rid of Justin Verlander, who was only there for a half a season, surprisingly. And that was really the most surprising trade of the deadline to me. But they, they stockpiled their farm system. And, oh, by the way, who's a free agent next year? That's a pitcher who the Mets could easily be in the running for with an owner like Steve Cohen. Shohei Otani. They could easily unload the Brinks truck for him and welcome him to Queens with Kodai Singer. A Kodai Singer. Like, so, you know, like, they, they they have the pieces. They have the pieces. I don't see the Mets going anywhere. I think in some ways they're kind of a winner at the deadline, or at least their fans are, because they can at least rest well in knowing why they sold players, they sold high on them, they came out with good returns, and oh, by the way, Steve Cohen will be back. And I think he's going to be back with Avengers. Yes, you cannot buy championships, but winning has a price. And it's a price that I think Steve Cohen is willing to pay, whether it's for his team or to help another team find a way to get into a World Series championship like he has done this trade deadline. Yeah, no, yeah, you said it best. I mean, that's, that is true. And I think, you know, Otani, the Otani sweepstakes, I mean, it's it's going to get, you know, it's, I mean, it's already been hot conversation through the past months, but you know, Cub fans have been getting talking about like, oh, these last, there's been a couple reports, people talking about, oh, the Cubs are going to be in the running, which is not surprising whatsoever. I expected the Cubs to be in the running. Um, but a lot of people still think he's going to end up on the West Coast somewhere, which makes sense to me, whether it be, whether it's the Dodgers, whether it's the Padres, whether whatever it is, or, or hopefully not, but he remains in Anaheim. I mean, that'd be rough, but. He could, he could easily go back. So yeah, the Mets will definitely be, I think, the hottest uh, uh, East Coast team to to you know to get his attention there. But you know, another East Coast team I wanted to talk about as well in the deadline because they uh, because not only because they didn't do much, but they did have a deal. And I think their only deal might have been the one that uh, had to do with uh, the White Sox as well, and that's where uh, Keenan Middleton went. You know, the Yankees um, they didn't do much at all. Very weird, just a very weird. Uh, like just because I feel like you never really see the Yankees in this situation, like even in years where they were bad, like you knew whether they were sellers, like in 2016, where they, you know, traded Chapman to the Cubs, Andrew Miller to the, you know, Guardians. Uh, but in general, I just think, you know, I think it's also just because I have a micro microscope on the Yankees because like, you know, I watched those interviews with, you know, Aaron Boone and talking Yanks. And then I also, I'm one of my buddies, the Yankees fan. So I get to kind of have a pulse on them. And it's just so, it's just such a weird situation. But what are your thoughts on the Yankees right now? It's one, is it one of those things where you think they should have, you know, traded more of their guys that are on walk years, guys like maybe even like Bader or, you know, Juan Peralta or, or whatever it is, you know, Kane Lee, for example, too. Or, or do you think they still have a chance, you know, to make a postseason spot? So, you know, adding Keenan Middleton was the right thing to do. I mean, they're three and a half games 
out of a playoff spot. Mm -hmm. They have a chance. The question is, is will the offense show up? And can the bullpen be trusted to hold leads? I don't know about the bullpen, but with the return of Aaron Judge into the mix and Stanton trying to show some signs of life as of late, this could be a team that makes the next month, if not a month and a half, very interesting to watch in the Bronx. And it is weird to see that they weren't heavily active at the trade deadline. But then again, it's not. This is a team that made some splash moves in the offseason, signing Carlos Rodon, who's missed most of the year, but recently has returned to action. Got to see what you can get from him. Hopefully, you know, he's able to give them some quality starts and they could pile up some wins and fight to retain a wild card spot, which looks to be their only hope of making it into the playoffs in an American League East that if you're not at the top, that's what you have to play for. So it, it, it's a lot. It, I have a lot of questions about the Yankees. I have always have. I mean, this is not George Steinbrenner's Yankees. Nope. They don't spend that money like mm -hmm. they once used to. And oh, by the way, Aaron Boone is a manager who is on the hot seat, if you ask me. Oh, yeah. And yeah. what and how this team performs, shall I say, within the next month to a month and a half, is going to determine whether or not he even has a job. So I think Brian Cashman is really in a in a state where he has to wait and see how this all unfolds and then reassess and recalculate things come this fall, depending on how things take shape. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, Aaron Boone, I think, for sure is in the hot seat, one of the hottest seats. And, I mean, it's just – you know, as you mentioned with the offense, that's been their main problem, right? It's been the, you know, they, they have, it's another thing too, is that their bullpen, while, while, while it, you know, albeit taxed, is one of the best bullpens in the league. Maybe that's why they got Keenan Middleton, but I didn't think they needed a guy to get, like Keenan Middleton. So that's why I was kind of surprised that they got a guy like that. I was, I was expecting more, maybe like a bat, like heck, like a guy like Josh Bell would have been perfect, I think, there because, because then, you could you could either DH him, maybe give Rizzo days off because he needs it. He's been one of the mm -hmm. coldest guys in, in the league. So and also he's just a lefty who can hit bombs. So why not? I don't know. Something like that, just a spark, right? With that and short then it, porch. They, yeah, exactly. It's just so it, they didn't work out, or they didn't end up doing anything like that. So I was a little surprised. Um, but yeah, and I think at the end of the day, though, they're the one thing that's going to hold them together besides just in general the offense is is this basically plays into that. But Aaron Judge, if Aaron Judge takes off. They're going to be fine. And he def he can. I know that there's still some, you know, he's not technically 100%, but he's playing, kind of playing through it, um, which, which is pretty unfortunate. But we know that, you know, judge with one foot is probably better than a lot of guys on two. On two. So yeah. uh, either way, I think that, you know, he'll have a hot streak and that'll help them out because, yeah, I mean, having a guy like Garrett Cole, and, and not being able to put him out there in October is would be pretty disappointing. And ho hopefully they're able to make a run because it's one of those things where, uh, you know, we, we've seen Yankee Stadium, the new Yankee Stadium in the last decade. It's a great place for postseason baseball. Super loud. And the lights, you know, they, they were one of the first teams to start doing those lights things. It's 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 a great it's a great sight. So we'll, we'll see what happens. And, of course, everyone like, likes watching Aaron Judge hit bombs. So I think it's another reason, too. So, um, but, yeah, before we go to it, I wanted to ask you, uh, is there any any of these guys or any any low key deal that you think is going to make a big impact in the postseason race? Like I think, you know, as much as um, you know, this deal, like for example, for a guy like Middleton, as we talked about, or even like a Flaherty, you know, who knows? Maybe Flaherty goes off, right? And but the, is there any any guy in particular that you you think is going to make a big uh, you know, impression down the stretch, down the down the you know, this pennant race? Hmm. I, I got to think on that one for mm -hmm. a minute. I I I, I like the, the Justin Verlander to Astro. Mm -hmm. I like the reunion. It was a reunion that I didn't see coming, but I think that's going to really recharge Justin Verlander and put a, a, a vote in his step a little bit towards helping the Astros get back atop of the American League West. When I tell you this American League rest, race, it's going to be something to watch. I, I mean it. I mean it with every word I say. And 
that Astros team, no matter how much you want to try and count them out, they're so battle tested. And they they've been in wars for years and, and, and fights for years. And no matter what they do or how they may start a season, they always find a way. And they coming. They won six out of their last 10 games. You get Verlander over there. And if Framber Valdez can find a way to, you know, get back to his old self alongside of the young talent that they have, watch out. That that's to me, that was the under the radar move because that was the move that nobody saw coming. Dodgers, maybe. You know, I I really didn't think that the Mets were going to trade Verlander as much as it was being reported. But after seeing that he got dealt. It was dealt back to his old stumping ground in Houston. Man, that the league, the league should be aware of that, especially hitters in the American League. Yeah, and actually, you bring up a good point. Actually, we'll we'll, we'll talk on that for a sec too. Is uh, I think what really stood in the way of the Astros winning the pennant again, because you could say the Astros are going to win the pennant to begin the season in general. But I think the one thing that stood in their way was if the Orioles made a big splash. If the Orioles made a big splash, then you maybe say, hey, Orioles have a shot at overtaking the Astros. And I think the fact that the Orioles stayed pat, for the most part, in the, in the sense of not getting a big stud. Do you think, right as of right now, then, it's it still remains, right? The Astros are – would you agree that Astros right now are the team to be in the AL as we stand even now after the trade deadline? Oh, absolutely. I think yeah. they've been the team to beat before the start of the season. I think they're the team to beat right now. Anytime mm-hmm. you have the, the World Series championship from the previous year in the American League pennant, you are the team to beat and to prove it otherwise. And mm-hmm. Baltimore is the team that has to prove it. I love the Baltimore Orioles and what they've been able to build there. Mm-hmm. They're a young, hungry bunch of guys. Those guys are fight. They're never out of a ball game. You see guys like Gunnar Henderson coming along, Colton Cowser, Jordan Westberg. And Allie Rushman, it's cool to see their growth and development and growing together and learning from one another and their experiences coming up as young guys from the minor league level to the major league level. But you have to show it. And Mm -hmm. these guys have never played in the playoffs before. And while I'm eager and excited to see how this young bunch fares coming out of the American League East after managing to hold their own thus far through the first several months of the season, you know, you got to, you can't just tell me, you have to show me. And until proven otherwise, I, I truly believe that the Houston Astros are indeed the team to beat. I think that the Baltimore Orioles will still find a way to win the American League East. As I said before, going we went to the second half of the season, and, and, I, and I thought that Tampa Bay would be a team that struggled a little bit. I would have liked to see Tampa Bay make a, a few big moves or two. I know they got Aaron Savali, but yeah, Houston's the team. They are the team. And someone has to step up and show out and prove that they have what it takes to beat them. Yeah, you're right. And I think, you know, with the ask with the, uh, excuse me, the Rays, I think what they saw they needed was, start, was, you know, some rotation help, some pitchers in general. And they got that, you know, with, with Savali, with, you know, with the Cubs setting Adrian Sanson there, a guy who I think belongs to the big leagues. It's just that, you know, he was blocked by a bunch of, uh, you know, Cubs starters there. He didn't get really get the chance to come back this year and do anything. So, yeah, and he's got great stuff. So, yeah, I think the, the Rays, I think they kind of cooled off, and I don't see them necessarily making as deep of a postseason run as I first expected them to. Could be wrong there. But it's just, I don't know, McClanahan hasn't been as dominant as other, you know, as, as I thought he would be. He's still a great pitcher. But when you when I just expected him to even be, you know, as elite as, like, you know, like Cole is doing right now, kind of have, you know, up there with the Cy Young candidates. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I think Eflin's been better, but you know, with Glass now, you you can't really trust his health all the time because, you know, so that I think they made the right moves there. But we'll see what happens. The AL is one of the more you know interesting. You know, ha- have always have one of the more interesting uh, AL pennant, uh, you know, uh, scenarios when it comes to ALCS and all that stuff. Those matchups are always good. The NL, of course, has a bunch of juggernauts, and you don't know who's gonna w- come out of there, but you know that whoever does. They're gonna give Astros. They're gonna give the Astros uh, everything they everything they can. So it's gonna be interesting, regardless how down the stretch these deals affect the pennant race and all that. And uh, of course, for these two sides, of course, the White Sox, you know, have bowed out obviously, but the Cubs, 
they're making a run. Hopefully they're able to, to make, you know, make some noise, whether it be late in September and sneak into the playoffs, but we'll, there's going to be a lot, there's a lot of baseball to play. That's for sure. Uh, I got two, two months left. So uh, of course we'll, we'll be ready to talk all about that over the next couple of months, but I think it's a good place to wrap things up. This edition of the at bat podcast. I want to thank Gabe Wilkins. who, of course you've seen on war media's open run. And of course, uh, best shout out to miles Porter who uh, played in his all-star game on Tuesday. So hopefully when he comes back and we talk about it next time around, um, he'll talk about how we hit a home run or something like that. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, but hopefully everyone enjoyed this episode and everyone enjoyed the trade deadline and uh, best of luck to your baseball team. See you next time.